Thank you, Jason, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak this morning. So uh, as Jason mentioned, I'll be talking about system science, the next frontier for food, nutrition, and health. And let's see. This. Uh, so starting with some disclosures, uh, we receive uh, uh, a number of different grants from the NIH, uh, including NICHD, uh, as, as well as we have a contract with the uh, National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute. Um, and our GOPC, which is the Global Obesity Prevention Center, is a university-wide center that's headquartered at the Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, but includes all the different schools and departments throughout the uh, university, including the uh, Cary Business School, the School of Engineering, and the School of Medicine as well. Um, and then we have uh, a number of different projects across the world, and an administrative core, system science core, and an education and training program. So quick, that was a quick overview. So this graphic over here, we like to use this for, if I can find the pointer. Um, oops, maybe I'll just. Uh, the ribbon. Okay, I don't quite see it, but I'll I'll gesture towards that direction. Um, so this this schematic over here that we use for global obesity really can apply for all food, nutrition, and health. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to show here is that there are a number of different systems that impact uh, food, nutrition, health, chronic diseases, obesity. It's not just a single cause, single effect. It's not just a single factor. So you have a variety of different biological factors, you have a variety of different social factors, behavioral factors, economics, uh, policy, environment, all these different things. So, so to really understand and improve food and nutrition and improve health, you have to really address all these different systems. So uh, Stephen Hawking is a very smart guy, obviously. Um, and he said, a, he uh, made a statement, uh, I believe it was about a year ago, that was at the same time a very good statement and also maybe not so good statement. Uh, he said that obesity, the obesity epidemic is the uh, number one major problem in the, uh, facing our world, which was great, but then he continued, but fortunately the solution is simple. And that's when everyone sort of stepped back and said, oops. Uh, because it's actually quite complex. Um, so this is a paper that we published in Nutrition Reviews, really showing, you know, if you really want to address nutrition and, and food and health, you really need to address all these complex systems. What exactly is a system? Well, a system is a collection of components and parts that are not independent. They're actually interrelated. So all of us are parts of a system, uh, whether we realize it or not. Each of us consists of a system. We have biological systems and physiologic systems within us. Um, and when you don't really address these systems or understand these systems, a number of problems can occur. So one is uh, you, you use Band-Aids rather than uh, solutions. In other words, you try to patch problems or cover problems. Uh, you have unsustainable solutions. You might miss secondary and tertiary effects. You have unintended co consequences. Potentially, you, know, you, you, you have an intervention, you might have an unintended consequence. You also miss, might miss the positive effects that an intervention or policy might have, and you expend uh, considerable time, effort, and money uh, and resources from trial and error. Uh, so I wanted to go, quickly go through this since I, I, I did uh, talk about this during, the, um, uh, during a meeting, I believe, about a year and a half ago. Um, but you know, one of the things we're also seeing is this advent of big data. So this is the definition of big data, high volume, high variety, high velocity. Uh, this really gives us a lot more opportunity to really better understand these different systems that we are um, immersed in. And so there's a variety of different big data processes that have emerged, including ways of managing big data and analytics. I won't go through this in great detail because this is not a big data, um, big data talk, but uh, I wanted to point out that there's different ways of looking at or using big data. So one is these top-down approaches where you look at these trends, these associations, uh, these are an examples of big data approaches, but the problem with, with these top-down approaches is you really you look at these general associations, these general correlations. For instance, coffee makes you live longer. That's an association that was, that was shown in, some, in a couple recent studies in Annals of Internal Medicine, but is it really coffee that's doing it? What, what about drinking coffee might contribute to that? Could it be the antioxidants? There are all these complex systems that might be at play, 
and a top-down study can suggest associations, but it really doesn't show what's actually happening from a cost and effect. So what we like to do is we like to try to build up the system. Uh, so we use these so-called bottoms-up approaches where we recreate all the mechanisms that are involved in a given system, and in doing so, really try to understand the cause and effects and how these different things might interact with each other. So there's different approach examples of systems approaches. One is systems mapping, which essentially is saying, okay, let's draw out or map out visually the different components of the system and how they affect each other. Um, examples of this are social network analyses, uh, causal loop diagrams. And then once you've mapped out the system, then can you create a representation of the system, uh, for instance, a computational model that can really represent the system and then you can use it as a virtual laboratory to, to test different possibilities. Uh, so I'll be focusing um, on these two things, systems mapping, systems modeling, particularly systems mo map, uh, modeling. Whenever we do modeling, we, we always do a systems map first. But in essence, with the advent of big data, you really have a lot more information, a lot of data that you can use to then uh, populate and calibrate these models. So let me give an example of uh, some of the models that we've developed uh, to help understand these systems. So as all of you know, there are many other different complex systems in many different industries and sectors. So we've really seen systems modeling transform a lot of these other industries. So if you think about transportation systems, manufacturing systems, the weather, uh, you know, even sports, there are many examples of computational models that really have changed decision making. So if you think about, for instance, a weather map, uh, whenever you look at a weather map, that essentially is a simulation model. It takes these diverse different streams of data such as barometric pressure, such as temperature, what the tides are doing, uh, the terrain, and unifies it in a simulation model to produce what you see in the weather forecast every day. Uh, so you see that map, but that's basically just a visualization of what the model is showing and what the model is predicting. So uh, if you try to think about back in history and try to imagine what it was like prior to the advent of weather maps, prior to the advent of simulation models, you know, how could you figure out what the weather is going to be in the next week or month or even the next few hours? Uh, so maybe you could look at the sky, you could look at the moon and the clouds and those things like that and, and ask the cows. But you really can only make very gross predictions of what's right in front of you because you didn't really know what was happening. There are all these diverse data streams and how do you connect all those different things? Now we take it for granted. You know, we like to make fun of the weather, weather forecast and say, well, it's accurate to some degree. But the accuracy is quite remarkable if you think about it when you compare it to maybe 100 years ago. And there are many other examples. Air traffic control is another example. You know, in order to coordinate all the flights and the planes that land on the various different airports, not just within our country, but across the world, that's very challenging. And without a computational simulation model to predict where a plane is going to be going in the next few minutes, you know, you'd have a lot of disasters occurring. So when I talk about computational modeling, I don't mean the left, I mean the right. I mean basically, basically taking a uh, computer or a whiteboard or a set of equations and trying to represent a system. And I want to emphasize that modeling is not a replacement for other types of studies. I call this the Skynet concern. Are you guys familiar with Skynet, which is the, the antagonist in, uh, in Terminator? Uh, these computer models are not supposed to be self-aware um, models that will ultimately take over the world, uh, at least not right now. Um, but essentially, they're there to help decision making. Ultimately, decision makers or people make these decisions, but models can help facilitate those decisions. And they essentially can take a need or idea and help de design and develop a, a retrospective study or plan a prospective study. Uh, it can, they can also fill in the gaps. Like for instance, say you do a study in Los Angeles and you want to know what might happen if you do the same thing in New York City, or London, or Las Vegas, or um, Tokyo, uh, rather than repeating those studies in every single location, if you create a computational model, you can see what might happen under changing circumstances. Similar with prospective studies, we know that there are issues with generalizability and, and study population. But in addition, there's, they can be quite expensive. And they can also, uh, you can run into ethical issues. You know, if, you're, if you're trying a natural experiment, or you're trying a prospective study, where the potentially there might be harm to uh, different individuals. 
then you could potentially use a simulation model to overcome some of these challenges. And of course, translating the, these analyses to policies and practice. Uh, I also want to emphasize that in all cases, uh, a true systems approach is really an iterative approach. So you don't disappear, you don't say, okay, I'm gonna develop a model, you disappear for six months in, inside a cave and then reemerge with an answer for everyone. Instead, this is supposed to be an integrated process where essentially you are developing initial models and you dis those initial models can help elucidate important factors and relationships, help prioritize uh, data collection, so it can show you what data you have and what data you don't have. Uh, you can test different policies and interventions, you can inform stakeholders, you can design and implement interventions or changes, and that generates more data and results, and then that helps you update the models. This is very similar to what happens to each of us after we're born. So when we were born, we have these very simple mental models in our head, so we, we know a few things that we know how to cry and lay around. But then as we get older, we start assimilating evidence and information. So we look over and we said, okay, stove, that's hot, don't touch that. And then that, you update your mental models. So that ultimately it becomes instinct. Whenever we talk about instinct, that's really your mental models running uh, very quickly. So you know, okay, I'm not supposed to you know, run screaming out of this room. Well, uh, and that's from from sort of your mental model understanding, okay, that's, I probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, so in the same way, you're updating these computational models and getting, they're getting better and better uh, along the way. So you don't, you don't wanna aim for the perfect model at the very beginning. So let me give you a couple examples of these types of models. So the first uh, we call VPOP, Virtual Populations for Obesity Prevention, uh, which is similar to our K-POP. Um, these are basically sim cities for obesity prevention. So we're, we're developing simulation models of different cities and communities uh, throughout the world. So examples are Baltimore. Uh, we're working with the New York City Health Department to develop a simulated model of, of New York City. Uh, we've developed one of New Orleans and we're in the process of developing one in uh, Washington, D.C. And we're also looking at other international cities to do that as well. But they're essentially representations of all the key elements that are relevant to diet and physical activity. Uh, so these include the entire population within these cities. So each of these, uh, each of the people within these cities are represented by these computational agents. And each of these agents have different characteristics. We also represent the households, food sources, workplace, schools, and physical activity locations uh, within the uh, city or community. Uh, and as I mentioned, each, each person is represented by a computational agent, and um, just like a real person, each agent has a set of characteristics like an age, a gender, uh, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, home assignment, school assignment, if they're children, work assignment, if they're adults, uh, height and weight, um, and all these different things. So also within each of these within each of these agents is an um, embedded metabolic model. So uh, this was developed uh, from initially by Kevin Hall at the NIH and has since been adapted, but it basically takes what the caloric intake and all the nutritional intake um, is for the individual, and then also the caloric expenditure through physical activity, and then converts that into changes within the body, like changes in weight uh, we've also incorporated CDC growth curves, so the children over each simulated day and each simulated year will grow, uh, grow taller, and hence their BMI will change. So what they do throughout the day will then determine whether they maintain the same growth curve or it will push the growth curve up or down depending, if they're, depending, their, depending on their energy balance. So each day, each of these virtual people, just like real people, um, wake up and then they go through their daily schedule making a variety of different types of decisions. So for instance, they may wake up and they say, okay, should I eat breakfast? Um, either they say, okay, no, I'm not gonna eat breakfast, or if they do eat breakfast, they have to make a decision. Should I eat it at home? Should I eat it along the way to where I'm going? For instance, if I go to school, um, or should I eat it at school? And then they make these decisions like, for instance, if it's a weekday, should I go to school? And if I do go to school, should I walk to school? Should I, be, should I take a car? Should I be airlifted? You know, all these different uh, potentials. 
And each of these things have implications. So depending on what you eat, where you eat, you're going to have ingest a certain number of calories and you're going to ingest a certain number of uh, different types of nutrients. And if you walk to school as opposed to be carried to school, then you're going to burn a lot more calories. So throughout the day, they're making different types of nutrition and food uh, decisions, and they're also making a number of different uh, caloric and physical activity decisions. Okay, so let me just show you a visualization of this, just to give you a sense of... Okay, so you can see that uh, this visualization is scrolling through uh, the different zooming in and out of Baltimore just to show that you can move around. We, we actually have a s synthetic population of the entire United States, so if we wanted to develop a model of any location, we could do that. Um, and essentially, within this map, you have uh, different key locations marked out, and each of those locations have different characteristics. So here's a park, and this park has a baseball field, and this is this size and this location. And each of the different food sources also has uh, a number of different characteristics. So, for instance, a corner store might have particular stocking patterns. That's going to influence what the kids will eat. So if a kid stops by at a, at a corner store and there's a certain distribution of food, then that child is more likely to choose different types of foods as opposed to another store which might have a different distribution of food. Now you can see representations in this case of some kids moving around. Uh, each of these kids uh, are um, by coincidence, shaped like donuts, but um, the <laughs> blue ones are, represent uh, males and the red ones represent females. And then they're traveling to school in different places. So what they do is they essentially choose the fastest route to go from where they want to go. And when they pass by certain locations, they're, they have a probability of actually entering those locations. So for instance, if, if a child is walking through a neighborhood with lots of corner stores, then there's a potential probability of that child stopping by one of those corner stores. More likely the closer one, but it's, uh, it's, it's like an expanding probability. So you have less lower probability of going to a further one, but you still do have a probability of going to that further one. And then they, they will choose food, et cetera. So then over time, we can track different measures, like for instance, BMI over time and see what happens. So let me give you some examples of uh, some uses of this model. So for instance, this is an example of uh, using the model to help support decision making, policy making. Uh, so uh, a couple years ago, uh, the Baltimore City Council member uh, Pete Welch uh, sponsored a bill that would provide tax credits to any landowner or lot owner who would establish an urban farm. So if you have an empty vacant lot and you establish an urban farm there, then you can get a 90% tax credit. Uh, so a lot of people were interested in, well, what's the potential impact of that? You know, the challenge is you can do a study, but that would take years. So you could take two decades to do a study, and, and you know, 20 years later you have your answer, and that's far too late. So instead we simulated what would happen if you established urban farms to different to varying degrees throughout Baltimore. Uh, and this helped um, help inform some of the policy making. This is a picture of Joel Gittleson, uh, who's a faculty member in our center, That's his back is towards you, and he is uh, providing a testimony and showing some of the results to the city council. And on the uh, left is a policy brief. Um, so this just shows some examples of, you know, what, uh, what's the conversion rate for uh, vacant lots to urban farms, you know, what's the impact of uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables among adolescents, uh, and then we also track what would happen to different health measures such as obesity and chronic diseases. And this is a new story showing that the urban farm tax credit passed. So certainly there are other factors, but it seemed to be helpful for them to actually see what the results might be over time. Uh, another example is uh, this was a study published in Health Affairs where we looked at the impact of increasing kids' physical activity throughout the entire United States. as many of you probably know, we're facing a, a bit of a f uh, physical inactivity crisis, uh, especially among youth. Uh, if you look at some of the measures, so for instance, the percentage of youth that meet the minimum requirements uh, as specified this by the sports and fitness industry of three days a week, 25 minutes uh, each of those three days of moderate to vigorous f physical activity. 
that's less than a third of youth throughout the entire United States meet that minimum requirement. And it's actually not too hard to meet that. Um, if you look at some of the surveys, uh, there, there was one survey that I saw where they asked kids, you know, have you played sports once over the past year? And I think something like 30 to 35 percent of kids said no, they had not played sports once throughout the past year. So we simulated different, the impact of increasing physical activity to different degrees on different populations. And we, 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 uh, we were able to show what's the impact on direct medical costs, what's the impact on productivity, losses and all those different types of things. And it, it's, uh, all these numbers are well into the billions. So let me give you another example of another type of assistance modeling project. Uh, this is our Hermes project. And in this case, we are building simulation models of supply chains, so different types of food supply chains. Uh, so I wrote a piece in The Guardian which really looked at uh, the importance of um, uh, food delivery and food distribution and supply. Um, and as we know, there are many different types of uh, food supply chain structures that can be quite complex. And many times, there's many, in many cases, it's not even well understood exactly you know, where does food travel after it's, lead, after it's left the farm or if it's left uh, a, a producer. And so essentially, we've, developed a, we've been developing a software platform that can create computer simulation models of different types of supply chains. Uh, so we actually started off, so it's called Hermes, which stands for Highly Extensible Resource for Modeling uh, Event-Driven Supply Chains. Uh, one of the key things with a project, the most important thing with the project is coming up with a name. The actual project is secondary. Um, but we're developing this software tool which can, you can input different types of data and then you can generate this discrete event simulation model of the supply chain. And using that, you can, um, that can serve as a virtual laboratory to basically test you know, what's the impact of introducing new products, What's the impact of changing conditions or situations? Where are the vulnerabilities? What happens if you use new technologies? How do you optimize uh, food supply? Uh, and then, you know, what's the impact of different types of threats, for instance, to the food supply system? We actually started off um, in 2007 uh, looking at vaccine supply chains, immunization supply chains. And then that, uh, this is just a, an overview of some of the work in which we've worked with a variety of um, decision makers, different types of governments. Uh, the Gates Foundation, WHO, Gavi, um, including the leadership of the Gates Foundation. Um, and we've, we've gone through different countries and helped improve their, uh, or, or, or identify ways to improve their uh, immunization supply chains, um, ranging from you know, what's the impact of introducing new vaccines to what's the impact of introducing new technologies, like using drones to fly different medical products to different locations. Um, and then we've also worked with um, different countries, including Benin, to uh, improve uh, or redesign their health product supply chain. So this is a visualization of supply chain in Benin. Uh, there's the map of the Benin. Each of these columns represents the inventory, in this case, of vaccines um, on a given day. So you can see the columns going up and down uh, based on their uh, daily inventory. And when they turn red, that's when you start hitting capacity. You start hitting maximum capacity or going over capacity. And each of those lines that shoot between the different locations is a transport occurring. So this is, again, a visualization of the supply chain where products are moving uh, down the chain all the way through the population. So we can use these things to really identify what, where the vulnerabilities might be. Um, and then we work with the Ministry of Health to redesign their vaccine supply chain. So we're doing similar type of work now within, uh, with food supply chains. Um, so, in a food supply chain or a complex system, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, where, where do you intervene? You know, if you, there's a problem of getting food to certain to populations, where exactly is the problem? And many times it's multiple locations. Or even if there's not a problem, how do you actually improve the situation? Or what's the impact of changes? You know, we all know that populations change. We all know that food supply changes, uh, farming may change, uh, technology may change. So, it can be quite complex when you're trying to really understand the interactions of these different factors. Uh, so essentially what we do is we create these virtual representations of all of the entire um, supply chain, all the way from the beginning, which may be a farm, which may be a production facility, which may be location if you're talking about you know, fish, a fishery, et cetera. And then we represent each of the personnel, all the equipment, all the locations, all the routes, 
involved in getting that food all the way down to the population, including representation, computational representations of the demand of the actual population and their nutritional requirements. And then there you can basically test different, different policies and interventions and, and see what the um, impact might be. So, you know, again, you can help understand the key drivers of the system. You can uh, diagnose uh, resiliency and vulnerability to various types of shocks to the system. So that ranges from um, human-made shocks to uh, shocks from nature. Um, and also you can virtually test the impact of introducing new or existing technologies, and that includes new types of food products and behaviors uh, uh, before you actually implement it in the real world. Even after you've implemented in the real world, you can use this to really understand what the system-wide effects are. So those are just some examples of the questions that you can ask. So I want to uh, uh, give a shout out to our uh, system science core team. Uh, this is a collection of uh, people from many different backgrounds and, and disciplines, including computer science, engineering, um, biostatistics, epidemiology, nutrition, um, health, all, all these different areas that basically help construct uh, each of these different models. Uh, so these are just two examples of the computational models that we develop. We also are developing models of individuals, uh, different people, schools, and other types of locations. And, and uh, that's just uh, examples of some of the work that we're doing. So in summary, uh, food, nutrition, health, diseases are linked in this complex system. If you really want to tease out or understand the complex system, it's very difficult to do um, unaided because as, as humans, which I'm, sure, I'm assuming all of us are humans, uh, we, we can see one step and maybe two steps. We can see, okay, what happens if I push this object? What happens? Um, but seeing to the third or fourth degree, that gets more and more complex. Um, so we need these aids, we need these um, assistance to really understand these systems. Uh, so we feel that this can transform the way we really understand and address uh, dietary patterns, health, and diseases. Uh, it can really fully harness this growing body of information and knowledge and data that we have. Um, and I want to emphasize that, again, systems approaches is using these systems methodologies, but it's also changing the mindset in the sense that it's really bringing together different types of disciplines, different types of methodologies, uh, working together iteratively with stakeholders and decision makers to really develop these models to understand the, um, and really address these systems in an um, improved way. So with that, happy to open up the uh, floor to discussion. Thanks, Bruce. And thanks to Heather and Bruce. We're, we're back on time here. So we have time for, uh, I guess, a couple quick questions. Hi, I'm um, Catherine McMurray, NHLBI. Mm -hmm. um, this is a fascinating presentation. I have one comment and one question. One other uh, comment is that the um, physical activity guidelines for children are actually 60 minutes per day, mm -hmm. so the situation is even worse than you reported. Yeah. Um, the question is, um, in your modeling of um, food, activity, the map that you showed, um, it, it appeared that you're tracking calorie intake for food, and I wondered if it's possible to look at the types of foods eaten, or at least the macronutrient content mm -hmm. too. I know I understand it's very complex already, but yeah. um, it would be great if you could go into a little more detail at mm -hmm. some point. So good point about, so we also looked at the CDC guidelines, which are uh, for physical activity, which as you mentioned are, are um, a higher bar, so we start out with a lower bar and higher bar, and that's you know, if you can actually meet the physical, the CDC guidelines, you, the savings are even more. So, so, so thanks for pointing that out. Um, certainly. So we started off with, with just pure calories because that was simpler. Uh, not simple, but it was simpler. Uh, but we are adding those other things like macronutrients. Um, a big part of then is then figuring out what the pathways are, the mechanisms, and how they ultimately will affect health. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the things that we've done with each of these individuals We'll have a model that then, as they age, will project, uh, project what might happen to their chronic health status. Okay. So, for instance, so we've used combinations of like the Edmonton scoring system um, and some other systems to create this chronic health stage, where you know the first stage is basically you 
don't have chronic disease, the second stage where you have early uh, chronic disease, like you might have prediabetes or slightly elevated blood pressure, and then it progresses all the way down to you know, where you have significant chronic disease. And in each of those cases, you then have probabilities of developing different types of clinical outcomes, like a stroke or developing uh, you know, uh, diabetes um, or having um, a, a cardiac event like an MI, et cetera. And then you, then you have attached costs and, and uh, uh, potential mortality from each of those things. So we started off, that was initially driven largely by BMI, but then we we're introducing some of these other nutritional factors as well. Great, Great. Mm -hmm. thank you. Hi, Susan Roberts from Coca-Cola Company. Mm -hmm. Thank you, this is very encouraging that we're moving in this direction. Um, my question relates to the fact that uh, you're trying to harness the complexity, which is, which is what we need to do, mm -hmm. uh, but how do you decide on what elements to incorporate into your model because I just remember a few years back, um, the UK government sponsored the Foresight Report. Yeah. <laughs> and when you open that spreadsheet, yeah. it, it's just hugely complex. And so you're starting to get a grip. Can you help us understand how do you decide what to put into your model? Mm -hmm. so, so, so good question. Um, so many, many of you have, have probably seen that diagram of the Foresight map. And it's impressive, so people use it on slides to say, oh, it's complex, and then there's all, it looks like spaghetti, basically, you've got all these lines there. What we found many times with these complex systems is actually representing the complexity and understanding the complexity in some ways simplifies it, because you identify actually what matters and what doesn't matter. So the foresight map, while it's helpful to show that there are all these different factors, it really doesn't prioritize and doesn't really show that, okay, well, these things are very important, whereas these are, are less important. Um, so what we found is we do go through a lot of time to, to map out what's there and then to build the mechanisms, but then when we actually start running the simulation models and we do sensitivity analysis to very different factors, uh, invariably in many different systems there are certain things that come out as really the key factors. Um, and then you find that those are the large drivers and since it's a system you have this cascade effect. Uh, so if you do certain things and it, you know, then it can disseminate. I can't guarantee that will happen with every system, but it, it frequently does. So certainly there's a lot of upfront work to really sketch out all the different mechanisms and then to put it into the model. That's why these models can be very large and uh, very computationally expensive. But then ultimately you start finding that it's, um, there are certain factors that, that, that fall out. And we also can help identify you know, win-win situations which you might not see immediately. And, and I think that's one of the keys here, you know, where you can identify win-win situations where different stakeholders can actually benefit. You know, we all know that different stakeholders come to the table with things they need to pay attention to. So cer certainly businesses need to pay attention to how they're doing financially. Uh, you know, uh, uh, policymakers have to understand what's happening with the, po the population, uh, food and nutrition experts, et cetera. But we've actually found situations where you know, everyone can actually benefit because you, you are satisfying each of the different sectors. But it's, those are very hard to see without understanding the system. Because, you know, ultimately then everyone defaults that, well, you know, you know, there's a limited pie and, you know, I need to get my piece, et cetera. Um, so we've seen that benefit in many cases. All right. Well, thank you, Bruce. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jason.